this is this is gonna raise eyebrows when I say this. This country was a lot better off when the mob ran it. <laughs> Fuse box. <laughs> Okay, this is Fusebox number 225 on a hard roll. And you might want to go easy on the mayo. Yeah, you know, it's very mucus forming, you know? Mmm, sloppy. Greetings, friends. <laughs> And uh, welcome in to this, the 225th edition of Fusebox, knowingly entitled On a Hard Roll. And uh, I am your In Search of the Perfect Nothing Bagel host, Mark Rose, and over there, In Search of the Perfect Napping Position. Oh, 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 oh I found that, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure you have. <laughs> The Grand Marshal of the VU Meters, Milt Keynes, everybody. Thank you kindly. Boy, howdy, have we got a treat in store for you in this show, friends. Holy garb. I gotta say, man, that was way too much fun. Indeed it was. And I, I you know, and I'm really glad uh, that you got to attend that interview, Mr. Keynes, because I, I know <laughs> you're a fan of our guests' efforts there. Oh, buddy. And, and, and I really thought that uh, you were kidding last time when, when you uh, announced it, that uh, this guy was going to be uh, an upcoming interview guest. I mean, Well, uh, friends, as we uh, alluded to on the last program, we had a great pleasure to do an interview with a guy who knows <laughs> one or nine things about Grindhouse films and uh, a lot of stuff going on during those auspicious days in uh, one of the most, some would call, <laughs> infamous <laughs> locations in New York, the fabled Deuce, 42nd Street, and uh, none other than the man, the myth, the legend, 42nd Street Pete is our guest for this edition of the show, which uh, is part one of two parts, as there is so much great material to share that it just <laughs> would not fit into one show. And that was him at the top of the show, yeah? Uh, indeed it was. And uh, much more of that to come. Man, you know, there was so much I wanted to ask him that I just kept spacing on it. Because, <laughs> you know, he'd start talking about something and I'd just get totally swept away by whatever it was he was talking about. And then i totally forget what I wanted to ask him. A wonderfully entertaining chap. Stories from experiences, not anecdotes, friends. Well, you'll see, you'll see. We'll take a short reset right here. And uh, when we return, we'll have a chat with 42nd Street Pete. Join us, aren't we? That'll be fun. TheFuseBoxShow.com All righty, friends. So uh, our guest on this uh, next segment here, although he disavows any affiliation or resemblance thereto, uh, really is a grindhouse historian. Again, not his term, but others have stated it, and I'm uh, very inclined to agree. Pete has been uh, for years covering the films and related culture of uh, that period of time for years, as he uh, pretty much experienced it firsthand at the time, from uh, the late 60s all the way up to the uh, early and mid-80s. And has lived to tell about it. Indeed, as uh, it was a very fascinating and uh, tumultuous period of time. Some of that time was covered in an HBO series called The Deuce, uh, made a couple of years back. And uh, a host of other films as well, of course, by proxy in some cases, as uh, it, it, it really was the literal background in many, many films, uh, not the least of which, of course, is Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver. But uh, the culture of this area and its eventual demise is a fascinating story. 
Our guest, 42nd Street Pete, has been and is currently again a magazine publisher and editor and writer and uh, has had over a dozen film compilations released through video production company Alternative Cinema and has been featured in several documentaries himself about this uh, historic time and is the author of a bunch of books. And we'll get into all that with our guest, 42nd Street Pete. On this, the Fuse Box Interview. A grindhouse film historian by any other name would smell as sweet. And I just want to say thank you very much, Pete, for joining us here on Fusebox. We really appreciate it. Holy carp, man. This is a, a, a sincere honor. To have you come aboard, Pete. Thanks so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I, I never said I was a grindhouse film historian. <laughs> I, I had, funny, I had this conversation the other day, and I said, you know, a lot of people put labels on me, I said, but I never said anything, <laughs> which is funny, you know? Well, you've got that moniker now, whether you want it or not. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I saw something on, on, a, on a video from a convention, and I'm, I was I guess I was walking back to my table or something, and this thing went underneath it, convention legend, 40 seconds. Like, <laughs> well, okay. All right. You may not think of yourself that way, but I think a great many of us do. And let me ask you something. Did you, did you grow up in the city or, or where? Basically, I was born in New Jersey. I was close to the city in my formative years, I guess you'd say, like, you know, 1968, when everything was changing, I started going in, you know, to see, you know, uh, rock concerts at the Fillmore East and oh, uh, yeah. the underage drinking. But then, like I tell everybody, one time I went into Port Authority, instead of making the right turn to the subway, I made the left turn. And there I am on the corner of 42nd and 8th looking up 42nd and all these great marquees with all this wild shit playing on it. Oh, man, what an opportunity. I mean, it, it must have been like some kind of smarmy paradise, bro. <laughs> Were your parents uh, porn distributors or anything like that? Or no, <laughs> no, middle age, you know, second generation Italian-American, staunch Catholics, you know, beat the shit out of you for everything. Went to a Catholic school. You weren't allowed to see anything back then. Yes. As a matter of fact, when... They found out that they were running like uh, some of the universal horror stuff, like four o'clock in the afternoon. Mm. The school sent back a note to our parents saying that the kids shouldn't be watching this stuff. So, you know, my attitude's always been and always will be. Hey, if you don't want me to see something, there's a fucking reason for this shit. Yes. So I went up in the attic and found this old TV with rabbit ears, and I got to see Frankenstein kill Fritz. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you gotta do, you gotta do what you gotta do to see some of this stuff. Sometimes, as as we know, even now. Oh yeah, well, you know, the, the other thing too is, you know, we, we, you know, eventually we were allowed to see this stuff, and then, you know, some of the AIP stuff was popping up at four thirty in the afternoon on these this showcase. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the ultimate babysitter was the kitty matinee on Saturday afternoons. Yep, it started at like noon. And went till five. You basically got three Warner Brothers cartoons, the Three Stooges shorts, and two movies, usually black and white horror movies. <laughs> That's right. So we never told anybody what we were seeing. Of course, you had to sit through the occasional Jerry Lewis shit, but you know. Well, you know, we got to take the bitter with the sweet. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. One has to suffer for their art. Yes, know, absolutely. And that's things. certainly it. You know, especially in our, uh, in our present day, this term, grindhouse. The thing that's always hit me is that it, it was never called that at the time. People who were involved in all of this, that, they, that there was no label for all of that. It was more of an experience, right? Yeah, well, basically, there was two, two theories or two explanations. One was because most of these old theaters dated back to the burlesque era. Mm -hmm. So that was like the bump and grind. So they'd say grindhouse. But then Dave Friedman would tell us that basically, you know, some of these things ground out films 24 hours a day, which actually is a misnomer. There was only one, the harem that did that on 42nd Street. Most of these things, they ran to like three, four o'clock in the morning and then, then, then started up again like 10 in the morning. Yeah. And what years are we talking Oh, it was up at, pretty much up until the end. You know, it was like, you know, I, I was going over in the 60s. You know, I, I could vouch for that. But the whole thing is, and people would ask me, you know, why, why would these theaters open so early? I, you know, people get off their ships. They yes, go out. They, have, they right. have breakfast, which, you know, everything's turned around. 
So they want to go see a movie before they go home and hit the sack or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these places were basically, you know, 99 cents or a dollar 50, you know, first thing in the morning. <laughs> that that's not, wasn't only porn. It was all the theater. Because it really was just all sorts of material being yeah. played at that time. Yeah, like I said, the only the only one it was really twenty four seven was this dingy little. I just I just wrote an article about this too, the harem, which was basically upstairs, and it was like this shoebox, very ominously dark and dingy place. You know how some theaters have those ambient light walls, you know, little lights on the walls. Yeah, this didn't have shit. You had to light a cigarette later to make sure you weren't <laughs> sitting in something. Oh yeah, oh, man. <laughs> but that was that was the only one. Then the other one, you know, the Venus was open till. Seven in the morning, then close and reopen at ten. Yeah, you know those had to be pretty rough joints. Now, I'm sure lots of crazy going on there. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. There's a there's a documentary. Uh, I pretty much flipped on Tubi, but it's an extra on the pieces Blu-ray from Grindhouse releases. Yeah. Forty uh, Second Street, the rise and fall of America's most notorious block, and I'm on it. Hen and Lauder's on it. Oh man, a ton of people on it. Really, really great documentary. The other icon who really didn't make films, but. Certainly, uh, apparently had a big influence on you, and the organization still exists uh, not far from me in Seattle, and that, of course, is Mike Vraney's Something Weird. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, yeah. I heard a piece that you you did the other day that was uh, commemorating the passing of, uh, of Vraney, but what, what do you remember about him and all that? Because he was instrumental in... I, I, I met Mike at Schiller Theater, and he was a bootlegger. You know, everybody was a bootlegger back then. The guy who ran Chili Theater, you know, the guy who ran all these, all these convention promoters and guys like that. They all started out life as bootleggers. Mm -hmm. You know, I had met him there. He had a bunch of cool stuff, and you know, the legend has it that you know he was doing, I, I guess, one or two of Dave's movies, and Dave found out about it and <laughs> called him up, basically threatening to break his legs. And he turned it around and said, "Mr. Friedman, I'm so glad you got in touch with me. I, I want to put your movies out." Well, you know, Dave was an old school guy, and you know, I've talked to a lot of him extensively over the years. You know, unfortunately, most of them are gone. You yeah. know, Dave, Ted Michaels, you know, Nick Phillips, they never saw anything past the first theatrical run. And that was it. So they never envisioned television, VH, any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So Dave was like, "Yeah, I'll take a chance." And you know, when he got his first check, he goes, "How many more films <laughs> you want?" <laughs> No kidding. <laughs> yeah, and then that opened the door to, every, you know, Dave introduced them. Like, I get Harry Novak, you got Jimmy May, all, all these guys. H.G. Lewis. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, th th those commentary tracks uh, on Blood Feast, just amazing. Yeah, and, like, these, guys, these guys, you know, the, the, the thing is, when I first got involved in this, these guys never knew they even had followings. They were, like, so overwhelmed and so humbled, you mm -hmm. know, that, that basically people actually like that shit. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah, I mean, a rabid fan base, actually. Oh, yeah. And there was another thing, too. I was trade Mike Verini, uh loops for tapes. Oh, wow. Yeah. I admitted I bootlegged a couple of his things, and he goes, don't do that. I'll trade you. And I go, what do you want? He goes, uh, stag films. <laughs> so I think I put up, I remember what I did. I put up a sign in my booth, we'll trade, you know, VHS tapes for stag films and you know people brought them in so I got about a handful of air then I went through my own stuff figuring am I ever going to use this stuff and then I gave him like 300 films and then you know it was like what are you doing to introduce this stuff and he said something about Bucky Beaver and <laughs> I was living up at this horrible fucking place called Lake of Patcon in this house and I got all lit up one day and I said why don't I play a joke on Mike so set up my big video camera put on a trench coat hat sunglasses and had all kinds of props like a bag of weed a gun knife whatever and went off on the wonders of something weird video and how they say 42nd street and i'm 42nd street pete sent it to him as a joke well guess what here we are what 30 something years later the joke's on me well, <laughs> yeah <laughs> what, what do you suppose and i suppose this would happen when you're a kid just like it did for probably most of us but what do you think attracted you to this whole genre uh, forbidden forbidden yeah. Yeah. Weird. Well, I was always attracted to the weird shit mm -hmm. anyway. You know, frogs and turtles as pets and shit like that, as opposed to dogs. <laughs> so now I got two dogs, which are up and walking around. But uh, that, that was the whole thing. It was like the domain of the weirdos. I remember having the issue four of Famous Monsters, which is probably worth a million bucks by yes. now with the uh, yes. War of the Worlds guy on it, and having a nun tear it up in front of me. She found it in my, my book bag. Oh, my God. 
And they could do shit like that. Yeah, you know? I know. Beware the leather nun. You know, I was born in the phrase, you know, coming up in the 50s, right. you know, the, you know, the adults are always right. The policeman is your friend. Yeah, fuck that shit, you know. Do you think that maybe when Deep Throat was unleashed on the unsuspecting public, do you think that 42nd Street in that area kind of took a turn at that point? In what direction? A turn how? <laughs> well, for, for the well, I won't say for the worse, but maybe for the for the more exploitive. I was wondering if a lot of the theaters that were catering to more generic fare just became kind of more adult oriented. Well, there was always the ones that had the stuff, and, and the thing was, you know, Deep Throat wasn't the first. I think Mona was. Ah, right. But the whole the whole thing was. You know, there was stuff out there. You know, I, I, I just remember an instance where we used to go over there, like, I'm thinking, like, you know, still in high school, 68, 69. We were looking for, you know, the, the good stuff. You know, the porn stores <laughs> had, you know, the beaver shots, all that other stuff, you know, uh, complete nudity, but, you know, uh, stopping short of penetration. But, you know, we wanted the hardcore shit. So I remember this to this day that, you know, we went in this place and we just let it slip that we were willing to spend. And all of a sudden, this guy came around. He was wearing a brown leather jacket. I was the ringleader, so he put his arm around me. He walked me into the back room. And what I didn't realize, he was patting me down as we walked in to make sure I wasn't a cop. And then they had these manuals from Sweden that were translated into English that basically had a $20 price tag over a four ninety five price tag. Yep. And that was our sex education. <laughs> That's right. Were they sealed in plastic or no? <laughs> oh, yeah. You couldn't flip through them, but they always had, you know, they, they were the real deal. You know, yeah. we, we didn't have nothing else, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, that was the start of it. And the guy that frisked me down is the guy, if you read this book, Times Square, it was Bobby Suretsky. Bobby Suretsky? Yeah. Because I saw a picture. I didn't know this until a couple of years ago. It was Somebody actually put a picture of him up, and I'm like, Holy shit, I remember this guy. That was the guy. Well, for some of our listeners that may not know him, can you enlighten? Yeah, there was a whole thing going on with, uh, you know, Martin Hodas was the guy who basically invented the peep show. Mm -hmm. And Suretsky was a guy, Bobby Suretsky owned a bunch of bookstores, you know, these little hole-in-the-wall places. I think Midtown Books was where I was, on 42nd Street and all around Times Square. Former cop wrote this book called Times Square because Hodas, his buddy, and this guy Suretsky were all involved in this murder for hire thing. Wow. Which I think, you know, Bobby was the one. I think they made him turn rat and all kinds of other stuff. It's a really interesting book if you can find it. But that that's where it went down because Hodas was the guy who basically is credited with it, inventing the peep show. Yeah. An auspicious meeting there with this guy. Yeah. I, I, I always tell people, I said, you know, um, years of me hanging in bars and shit like that, you never know who you're drinking. <laughs> no, sometimes. you don't. Yeah, sometimes you'll see their face on the post office wall. Yeah. But because of Deep Throat, certainly, it became much more widespread. And Oh, it, that sort of kicked it into the mainstream because it, it became this, like, there was a bunch of court cases. You know, people got busted, this and that and the other thing. Then, you know, there was people bootlegging that and the devil and Miss Jones because they both hit, hit about the same time. Mm -hmm. And certain areas you could get away with it and certain places you couldn't. You know, New York was one of the places you could because, you know, honestly, I think everybody was getting paid off. Yeah, well, got that right. I think, I think it honestly came down to that because, you know, I was just a consumer back then, you know, crazy kid going over there doing, you know, doing shit until I actually, you know, started wheeling and dealing with other things. But, you know, I, I'd say like, you know, late 60s, early 70s, I was over there as a consumer, never knew it was really going on, never cared. And then uh, the whole thing was taking a U-turn in the 80s, you know, with the drugs and AIDS and all the other shit. Then it definitely wasn't safe at certain times. And plus, I was married at the point. You know, she knew I was going over there, but we weren't. I wasn't doing anything. I was just going to see movies and fucking around and stuff. So, well, that's what you told her, anyway. Right. <laughs> that was it. But then, you know, like I said, then then I got involved with you know wheeling and dealing and selling tapes and stuff. So my presence on that block was you know less and less, and then you know it just was wasn't worth it. You know. All right, Pete. I gotta ask you. I mean, you hang with some of the greats in this biz. So, uh, d did you ever meet? Diane Thorne, star of Ilsa, She-Wolf of the SS. Oh, yeah. Okay, Milt. Yeah. Yeah, actually, Diane Thorne's a sweetheart. Oh, man. Oh, Unfortunately, man. she's no longer with us, too. Right. Um, 
Yeah, we we did something. Uh, I met her at Chiller. That, that was a weird thing because she was one. I I think it might have been the second show they brought her out, and I know there was some fucking heat on that because of the character with certain people. Mm -hmm. But no, she came out. She she was very cool. You know, uh, came out several times. As a matter of fact, I think the last time I saw her, she she came out to Cinema Wasteland. All right, Pete, help me out here. Now, I get a whole lot of shit for loving this movie, which, of course, I consider the finest film ever made. All right. So what do you got for Love Camp of the SS? Okay, wait, wait, wait. It's Pete we're talking to here. <laughs> you you got to get that title right, man. Huh? What do you mean? No, isn't that a... No, no, it's Love Camp 7. Oh, really? Wow. My bad. All right. So what, what, uh, what's the verdict, Pete? Love Camp 7. That You know, I did a whole thing on um, the Nazi exploitation thing in, in my former magazine. That was like, I said, well, somebody's going to have to fucking do it, so it might as well be me. Yeah. I have to look at certain stuff, and, you know, you see Dave Friedman walking around in there as, as a Nazi general. <laughs> and, you know, yes. you, you see a couple other guys. I think, you know, Lee Frost, Wes Bishop was in that. Cressy was in it. You know, he's over the top. I mean, these guys were all outlaws anyway, and uh, yeah, you know, Dave was really hot on Lee as a director, actually. Oh, really? Because I think he he did um, what the hell was it? it? It may have been the Defilers. Oh, that's like one of the early roughies. Yeah, because he said yeah. he said nobody. He says there's only two people that could shoot a roughie, and he goes, the the Defilers. It was that double feature. That, oh, scum of the earth. Scum and the of the Defilers. earth. Yes. One of them. One of them. Lee Frost shot and one of them H.G. Uh, Lewis shot. Yeah, he, uh, Scum of the Earth, I think, was was Lewis, right? Seems to yeah, ring a bell. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. But he, he said Lee, Fro Lee Frost was, you know, could really shoot a roughie. And then, you know, like I said, they were these guys were all intertwined with each other. And, you know, I saw Love Camp Number 7. That played on 42nd Street a lot. That was bouncing around a lot. Well, of course. They knew good shit when they saw it. Yeah. You know, the perennial favorites were like that, Ilsa. Yes. And then, you know, make them die slowly to rain for 10 weeks straight. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Yeah, no. I guess it's, you know, to some degree, this this film is like, it's the first one. Yeah. I mean, it was the first of its kind to kind of explore this whole area. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I guess it's significant in film history uh, for that, if, if uh, nothing else. Yeah, but, but you know, you, you look at that, you look at Ilsa. And it's like, you know, it's tongue in cheek. You know, these guys are just, you know, having a blast with it. Then you look at the Italian ones and you're like, oh, fuck. Yeah. And I honestly can say, you know, I, I don't know where they ran these, but I have no recollection of any of that stuff playing on 42nd Street at all. Hmm. Somebody even sent me a times table that went up into the 90s. Nah. I don't think that, you know, at that point they could have got away with it. But I'm, I'm talking about like Gestapo's last orgy and beast and heat and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, that's not going <laughs> to. Yeah. It's probably a limited audience for that. Or maybe just did it even get the distribution? Because some of that stuff was pretty. Well, you know, you're, you're hitting the 80s and a lot of shit was going right to video. And I remember that stuff was on like it, it was like Jungle Holocaust was on. It was some kind of thing, world video or something. There were clamshells because mm -hmm. all the Nazi shit was on there. And it was a bunch of, you know, shitty Italian war movies that were on that. And, uh, yes. Then, uh, jungle Holocaust, yeah, which would have been, which has been released under like what? Seven different titles. <laughs> seven different now? titles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Be careful what you, uh, what you wish for. Yeah. It was on a double, it was on a double bill with raw, raw meat as carnivorous. <laughs> then it was, uh, <laughs> uh, what the hell was it? Last cannibal world. Then it was just cannibal. Then it was the last. That's I got sucked in with the last survivors. I had no idea what I was fucking going to see. I just oh, good poster, jungle movie. Let's go. You fuck me. Right. Yeah. Same thing again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I guess in 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 recent times, there's just there's this uh, this move towards uh, thank you to you know Tarantino and people like that towards this whole grindhouse feel of things. Um, what do you think? Get a time machine, because I just went. I just did another video on this about a supposed spaghetti western I just saw. Yeah. I don't even know why these people even try to do this stuff, but you see, you know, maybe I'm wrong in my mindset, but I don't think I am, because I grew up in this era, and all these genres, be it black exploitation, spaghetti westerns, biker films, cannibal films, whatever, 
only worked because nobody had ever done this before. And now it's like zombie films are so overdone. We don't need another zombie film for the next 10 years. No, we really don't. We really? No, we don't. And it's like, you know, Eli Roth tried that Green Inferno was homage to the cannibal Holocaust. Mm -hmm. No, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I think it's it's funny, too, because they weren't even born, most of them, no. <laughs> when this stuff was happening. So it's an homage to an ideal as opposed to, you know, really what was happening during those times. And, yeah, it's unexplored territory. Nobody had done it, you know. No, that's that's how Quentin Tarantino gets over. He rips everybody off. You know, the last thing that, that whole it put a Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, mm -hmm. that's Gary Kent's story. It's in his autobiography. He told the story many times on my radio show, even in my magazine. Now, Gary's, you know, Gary's in hospice care right now. Oh, wow. Did not know that. And he's pretty much, you know, there's a picture of him on Facebook. And, you know, I got his phone number. I, I've been trying to call him. He ain't picking up, so it don't look good. But the bottom line is Tarantino ripped off the story to make a movie. He never even credited to him. I mean, you want to read a book? Fuck my book. Read Gary Kent's Shadows and Light. It's the best book I've ever read on independent filmmaking. He, he was through it all. Al Adamson, he worked for Ted Michaels, Ray Dennis Steckler, Corman, all these people, you know? All right, you were saying that Clark got ripped off by Tarantino, though. How how exactly did that... Uh... Well, what happened was Tarantino invited him to lunch and picked, picked his brain about the whole thing. The thing was, him, Bud Cardos, and a bunch of other guys were out there right after the murders and didn't know it. This is documented. This isn't like I'm making this up or Gary would be making it up because he wrote it in his book. He was on my radio show a lot when I was doing the thing with Todd Sheets, and he even wrote it in my magazine. They were doing something with dune buggies, and this guy, Charlie, you know, was up there, was a mechanic, was Manson. Manson? Yeah. Are we talking, are we talking Charles Manson? Yeah, Charles Manson, yeah. So they hired him to fix the dune buggy, and he was jerking around, and they finally put pressure on him, and he did it. Well, the story was that Tex Watson was hanging around bothering the girls, and Bud was shooting a scene. And Bud told them basically to leave. We're doing a movie. So Bud's only going to tell you once. So Tex had these big shiny silver six-shooters on him. So Bud sees him nosing around again. Bud grabs him by the back of his neck, the seat of his pants, and tosses him down a ravine. As he turns around, he hears the guns going off, and he goes, holy shit, those were real. If I had known that, I would have never done that. Holy carp. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's you know it's it's usurped, and I think it sucks, and I think people people are being bullshitted. But you know, you got your rabid Quentin Tarantino fans, like you have everything else. And nothing I say is going to change their minds. And hey, that's that's your opinion. I'm just telling you the truth. That's all. You know, I've known the man for God at least 15 years. I you know originally met him. I did my first Grindhouse panel at Cinema Wasteland. We've been friends ever since. We all, we always were in touch. He's even been over my house playing with my dogs. <laughs> I even had this thing going on. I, I basically said I would stop bad mouthing Quentin Tarantino if he would give Gary the role of you know George Spann in the movie because Burt Reynolds was supposed to be it and he died. Gary, ever the gentleman, says no, give it to Bud because Bud sort of looks like George now because Bud was about ninety. But no, we give it to Bruce Dern because shit, we need a name, don't we, Quentin? You know, fuck the guys that you say you admire their work and love their stuff and how great they are. You don't give them anything because they're not a name. Oh, man. Preach it, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> he paints what he sees. Yeah, and the funny thing is, he's right. On a sad note, though, uh, Gary Kent, the chap uh, Pete mentioned there that was uh, in hospice care, well, he did end up uh, leaving us a few days after this interview was recorded. And uh, if you check Pete's YouTube channel, you can get more info on Gary's life and uh, what a, a mentor he truly was to Pete as well. Um, he apparently was uh, quite a kind and generous fellow and a mentor to many people. We get into even more stuff on the uh, final installment of this interview, and I promise you, it's a delight. Uh, I would urge those who are interested in any of Pete's uh, merchandise to follow the links in our show notes uh, to the various locations for the uh, aforementioned material. I can tell you that in uh, his new magazine, uh, Grindhouse Resurrection, he's amassed several contributing writers there who also have lived their various deuce experiences, and uh, their offerings <laughs> are enlightening as well. I mean, 
He didn't hate it, bro. What? Oh, you mean your your favorite film? Yeah. As a matter of fact, he said they ran the hell out of it on the deuce. Well, like we were saying, uh, Love Camp 7 was uh, indeed the first of its kind. And therefore, new territory, uncharted waters. Uh, you know, I think he put it well, too. The, the fascination with all these films of that time was that uh, none of them had been done before. And uh, therefore, it just... Kind of created a kind of uh, mythology. And why you can't go back and make one now. You can't go home again, as they say. And with that, uh, we'll call it a show, but not before thanking uh, our contributors to this edition of the program. Sabra May for exquisite ideificationmentisms. And, of course, a sincere thanks to 42nd Street Pete for joining us on this one. Truly uh, a delight to speak with him. As, uh, as I say, the uh, show notes have contact info for all his endeavors, and I urge you to snoot them out. Thanks as well to the now fully film taste validated uh, doctor of the dials, Milt Keynes, for technical assistance and so forth, and so on. A real pleasure on this one. And, and, and uh, hey, folks, if you haven't as yet subscribed to this here show, uh, please do it. I mean, hell, I think this one was some kind of a public service for dog's sake. Leave a review or comment or, or hey, if you're really feeling the spirit, how about joining us on Patreon? Yeah, it's really easy to sign up to and, and you'll get free swag, uh, exclusive content like, you know, Invites to the after show jello snorkeling party. You know, and all that kind of stuff. Maybe even get your own lanyard for the event. We love lanyards, don't we, folks? Really, don't we? It's patreon.com forward slash the Fusebox Show to get that started. So thanks, friends, for uh, pushing play on this one. And uh, we've got uh, more interesting things coming your way soon as well. So stay with us. I have been your hot glued to an ice cube host, Mark Rose, saying, until our next cartoon.